Good afternoon. Welcome to Edenwald's virtual event, Life Under the Umbrella, Finances and Senior Living. My name is Allie Watson Fowler. I'm the marketing coordinator here at Edenwald, and I'm just going to go over a few guidelines for our webinar today. This webinar is being recorded, and that recording will be sent out to everyone in attendance at a later date. You will notice that the chat feature has been disabled for this presentation. If you have any questions, or if you're having difficulties with the webinar itself, please direct those to the Q&A box, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists will answer as many questions as they can throughout the presentation, as well as after the presentation concludes. Now I'll turn things over to Edenwald's Director of Sales, Diane Stinchcomb, for a few brief introductions before we begin today's program. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. I'd like to introduce you to the rest of our sales team. We have Debbie Janka, who is our marketing counselor. Debbie helps uh, prospective residents learn more about Edenwald and senior living in general. And then we have LaShawn Muhammad, who is our moving services specialist. And LaShawn helps people make the move to our community once they've made a decision. And now I'd like to turn it over to our president and CEO, Mark Beggs. Everybody, welcome. So I'm Mark. I uh, have been the president at Edenwald since January of 2019. Um, it's been a great two years and a, a few months. Uh, it's, even though there's been a lot going on here, as we all know, with the pandemic, things have been pretty steady and calm at Edenwald. Um, and, and I just thought as part of my introduction, I would just sort of give a little update on how we're doing as a campus. Um, as Roland will sort of reflect as he go through, goes through his presentation, we have 100% uh, vaccination for our IL residents. Um, so we've started to open up a lot of our amenities. Uh, from a staffing perspective, we're actually at 85.8%. Um, I was just checking that a few moments ago and we have another 12 people willing. So we'll be a little over 90% vaccinated for the staff. Uh, so that's really allowed us to start to open up our amenities. We have visitation open on campus uh, for the IL residents, uh, basically unrestricted. I mean, masks and social distancing, but people can come and, come and go. Uh, opened up three of three of four of our dining venues. Uh, opened up the last, uh, the third one yesterday. What day is today? Today is Wednesday. Third one on Monday. So it's going well. Uh, about 70 people eating in each of those every single night. So it feels very normal here uh, with all of our activities and amenities open. So it's been been very good. Um, so and we just look forward to it getting better and better with each passing day. So uh, come check us out. It's it's worth it. So with that, I want to introduce Roland DeVasher. Uh, he is our VP of Finance and Administration. His, that's his fancy title. He'll sometimes just say he's the accountant, uh, but he's more than that. He handles a, a tremendous amount of stuff for us. He has a, a long, long, uh, many years of experience in senior living. He was with Blakehurst, I think eight, 18 years, Roland. Um, and he joined us in August of 2018. So uh, he's it's just great to, to have him as part of the team very informative, and I am going to pass it over to Roland so he can share his screen and get going. Welcome to Edenwald, Life Under the Umbrella. You've spoken with uh, Diane and Mark. Um, for whatever reason, I wasn't getting audio on my computer, so we're going we're gonna to wing it a little bit here and uh, see how it goes. All right. Edenwald began back in 1881 as the general German-aged people's home of Baltimore. The organization was formed to create an old people's home known as the Greichenheim. The, building, the first building began in 1882 and was at Lombard and Penn Streets downtown. Three years later, a larger building at, at Baltimore and Payson was purchased to serve the then 34 residents. And by 1935, the building was serving 72 people and a larger property at 22 South 8th Avenue was obtained. That's down in Irvington near Mount St. Joe's for some of our uh, Baltimore people. Uh, that building was later replaced in 1985 when Edenwald was formed as a continuing care retirement community uh, to best meet the needs of the existing and future residents. While today we are no longer an old people's home, we offer a senior living lifestyle. So if we could advance, please, Mark. There you go. Here's a picture of the Edenwald campus. Uh, this is taken above Towson Town Center. It's our southerly face. And in the distance, you can see Goucher College over to the uh, right side at the back. So we have a, a very uh, 
a campus that's right in the heart of Towson. It's got some wonderful uh, forestation behind us, and it's very central to the uh, to the Towson to Towson Town Center, which I'll get into in a little bit. For those who may not be familiar, what a life plan community is. Uh, life plan communities offer residents the benefit of an independent living apartment within a vital and socially active community, along with the covenant of life care and medical assistance if and when those services would happen to be needed. So think of a life plan community of an apartment that you may be used to from uh, other homes that you may have lived in and know that on site is a nurse or a medical center that's readily available. Uh, should the need arise. If we could advance. Now, why Edenwald as opposed to another life plan community? Well, as I pointed out, we are in Towson. We are local. As a single site community, our leadership is on site and here to operate the community every day. Our board of directors meet monthly and it is comprised of local leaders familiar with Edenwald in the greater Towson area. This gives us some flexibility and an ability to first listen, to listen, excuse me, to listen firsthand to our resident suggestions and concerns. So in preparation, I got to thinking about the, um, some of the board members, and I thought I'd point a few out. Uh, Emily Brophy is the senior general manager at Towson Town Center. It's literally right out the window, about 500 feet away from us. So she understands the community and the campus and is a great partner to have locally. Larry Cook is retired from wider turning construction. Now wider turning was instrumental in the building of the building uh, when we had an expansion in 2008. So having Larry on the board, it's wonderful to have somebody who understands not only what went physically into the building, but how the community operates on an everyday basis. We have Tracy Jacobs, who is the director of the Osher Lifelong Learning Center at Towson University. Tracy joined us uh, this year, as a matter of fact, and we're really looking forward to the opportunities by having her on the board that that might uh, provide. Now, in terms of uh, tenure, we have some board members who are even second generation board members. One gentleman who re requested to remain anonymous used to mow the grass when he was a kid. He actually used to be here and it's a great story and he's really dedicated to the ongoing success of the community and we thank him. We've had some with 20 years or more experience on the board. So we have continuity and an understanding of uh, what it takes to keep focused and moving forward. So very fortunate to have the board members that we do. Moving on, as a nonprofit, we offer contracts that may provide a large medical expense deduction in the first year. When shopping, ask what that uh, medical expense deduction looks like for that community. For 2020, our year of entry medical expense deduction was 96,100 per person. So for a couple, you're talking, what, 192,200. So that was a significant amount. It, many people opted to um, perhaps convert some of their stocks, and that was a nice deduction that they could use to offset any capital gains that they had. Uh, in addition, the medical expense portion of monthly fees was 23,700, again, per person. So there are some tax advantages to looking at a life plan community and a not-for-profit especially. I will predicate that on saying that, please understand that these amounts are not guaranteed and they are subject to annual review. Please speak to your tax consultant to get the best uh, information available. All right, why again, continuing with Enwald as opposed to another LPC, we are, our proximity to local culture, healthcare, shopping and entertainment attractions. Towson is a vibrant, growing community. For those of you who know the Towson community, you know that there is a great deal of construction and growth, just wonderful aspects of uh, a new building that's going on in the area. So it really is a, a terrific place to see growing and, and, and uh, being local to. Goucher College is abutted to the property. We saw the picture earlier and we're planning future projects in partnership with the college. The Sheridan Hotel is a block away and it's within easy walking distance of our, for our out of town visitors. Towson Town Center, as I pointed out, is about 500 feet from our front door. So upscale shopping is readily available if you wanted to walk over. 
We offer transportation to healthcare appointments if needed. And we also plan multiple trips to this symphony and other cultural events in and around Baltimore. Some of our direct, directly available on-site amenities include a pool, a fitness center, a new beauty salon, an art studio, a library, and many other wonderful opportunities. We're also working to restore banking to the community very soon. If we can move on, please. We have four dining venues uh, that are available to all members of the community, including those in higher levels of care. Not all communities allow that opportunity. We offer a declining balance plan that can be utilized as part uh, as you choose to dine. Currently, our daily credit is $13, which can be used in its entirety for dinner or allocated to different times of the day, depending upon your schedule. Now, what that means is that that $13 allotment can be used any time during the month. If you have a 30-day month, it's $390. If it was a couple, both of you are given that $390 figure. And if you wanted to spend a little or you're gonna be away for a few days, you could buy a couple of meals ahead of time. There's flexibility, both in the dining options and the timing of when you wanna use it. If you're a person who prefers to have three smaller meals during the day, that's fine. We have a cafe that's open for breakfast you could get a cup of coffee and a donut. If for lunch you wanted just a sandwich, again, you could go there. And if you wanted a big meal, well, we have a pub, we have a large dining space known as the grill or the valley room, and we also have the cafe available. So we allow you flexibility in determining how you want to dine and the opportunity to make those decisions that best meets your schedule and what your preferences are. We're planning a redesign and a renovation of our memory care unit to maximize the life potential for our residents affected with memory loss. Our goal is to bring a new environment that is homelike and able to slow the progression of memory based upon cognitive impairment. Now we're still in the planning stages of this. We uh, recently met with residents of the community, uh, different staff members, and we wanted to find out what they would like to see and, and family members as well, excuse me to find out what they would like to see in a memory care space for our residents who have had a cognitive decline. It was wonderful, the feedback we received. We're looking, uh, we're working with an architect by the name of RLPS out of Lancaster, Pennsylvania, I believe, who has experience both with Edenwald and a great deal of experience in the senior living community. They understand and have experience to try and make a new memory care area what it can be, hopefully, a state-of-the-art environment that will meet the needs and maximize uh, the capabilities and the life for our residents who are in the memory care space. We're very excited about that. Our hope is to advance the project throughout the remainder of 2021, and we're hoping that by the end of the year or very shortly in 2022, that that becomes uh, a reality. So we're, we're moving it forward and we're very excited about the progress. Um, one thing I will point out though, about Edenwald as opposed to other life compelling communities, we're not so large that you can get lost in the shuffle. Now, there are many, there are, there are a couple of very large communities in the Baltimore area, uh, Charlestown, Oak Crest, they have in the order of about 2000 per person. That's a very large community. Um, what I like is that Many of our staff know the residents' names, just seeing them on an everyday basis. Our dining staff is able to address you by your name and can greet you, know your preferences, and be ready to meet those preferences, working with the dining staff, with the cooks. So that's really, that's a feature that not every place can say, and I'm really pleased that we can do that for you. If we can move on, please. Now, one of the big questions that I imagine you have are, is what about the cost? Well, Edenwald has multiple agreement types as well as different levels to buy in to provide the greatest flexibility to the consumer. For those who may not have experience in a life plan community, we offer two types of contracts. A type A agreement is designed to create a known cost throughout your time at the community. You're effect you are effectively prepaying for healthcare which relates to the medical deductibility aspect referred to previously. Um, now, I'll give you an example, and we have some numbers on the next slide, but 
the we have a unit that is called a Richmond. Uh, actually, go back if you would, please, Mark. Um, we have a Richmond that is 5,886 for a type A agreement under uh, our, current, our, our current year pricing. In the event that somebody were to have to move to life care into a higher level of care, assisted living or skilled care, well, then their rate declines to that of a chancellor unit, which is a slightly smaller unit. Now the Richmond is one bedroom deluxe with a den and two, two bathrooms. And a chancellor space is a slightly smaller, so therefore a slightly less expensive option. That 5886 declines to $5,083. So you may also have an additional fee for the, or you will have an additional fee for the uh, two extra meals that you would receive in a life care setting. But you have a sense that you're not going to jump from that 5886 to $11,000 a month. It's controllable. You have an expectation of what, how you need to budget and what you need to look at in planning your costs. Now, staying uh, on that same page, a type C agreement is designed to be lower cost, but they don't have the medical prepayment aspects that the type A agreement has. There's no medical deductibility unless higher levels of care are utilized. And these plans are generally favorable for those who have long-term care insurance. The, the value is that you're paying less on the front end, you're paying less on a monthly basis. And if you have long-term care insurance or you don't utilize the healthcare center using uh, in apartment care instead, then you're not going to have to pay the money, as much money for that healthcare until it's needed. So it's a wonderful alternative and we try and provide that flexibility for people in different situations. Let's move on if we could, please. Continuing with the, what about the costs? A type A agreement ranges anywhere from as little as 93,600 to over a million dollars, depending upon the unit size. They can be a 90% refundable, a 50 month declining contract, or an entirely non-refundable contract. Monthly fees range from 3318 to 6314 with the second person fee being $16.97. Now the type C agreements, as I said, are a little less expensive. Even though the lowest end is 100,000 and goes up to 800,000, they too have refundable options with 90% refundable or a 50 month declining option. Monthly fees range from 2247 to 6957 with the second person, second person fee being 1,070. Uh, anyway, fees are subject to annual review and are adjusted to meet the operational needs of the community. To give you a sense of how it works, each year we're looking at our staffing at the cost necessary to provide care in the health center, to provide food through the dining service, the culinary department, uh, to provide the options of life care, of a life care community. And then we consider what the increase needs to be. That increase is affected on January 1st each year, but we give a 45 day notice so that you're aware. Uh, we also bring it forward to the resident uh, representatives, the uh, resident association to give them a heads up and explain to them what our plan is, get feedback and try and customize the cost so that we only have to charge what we have to, to provide the services within the community. And what I would say is please discuss those options of a type A or type C contract with our marketing folks to get a more complete idea of the costs for the community. If we could please move on, Mark. Now, how is Edenwall doing? 2020 was a challenging year. I'm sure every one of us can make that statement. The, the COVID-19 pandemic state of emergency was declared on March 13th and it brought out the best of us, the best in us. Some of the examples I want to point out. With the mandated closures of our dining spaces, we shifted to an in-apartment or in-room meal delivery uh, system. This allowed for a safe and nutritious meal without our residents having to travel to the grocery store. We also provided temporary necessities, groceries, toiletries, paper goods, all those things that you are hearing about being so difficult to obtain in the early days of the pandemic. Well, fortunately, we have a great rapport with our vendors, longtime suppliers that were able to get us the toilet paper, the paper towels. Uh, we were able to get masks, PPE that we needed in our healthcare environment. We were able to get those things that many people were racing around trying to get 
You didn't have to worry about food. You didn't have to worry about getting supplies. We were able to make that happen. I'm very proud that we were able to adjust and adapt and still continue to provide the operation to provide our residents with those things that were in such short supply. Uh, number three, the remote activities and exercise encourage residents to stay fit and set a reduced sense of isolation for those who wanted to participate. Almost daily communication occurred to keep residents informed. Now, Mark Beggs, who you met earlier, was doing daily communication at the beginning of this. And we formed a communication strategy to help residents understand how we would meet their needs, what was going on, what the concerns were, what the Department of Aging is saying, what the CDC, all the different uh, regulatory bodies that were providing information, uh, were providing guidance. And we were very lucky. We had very little exposure within the community itself to COVID. We did have some staff members and a few residents who may have uh, contracted, but we were, compared to most other locations within the state, we did very well. We're very pleased with how well that, how that uh, was handled. Let's move on if we could, please. Some of the other, other uh, items that, as to how we are doing. Uh, screening and cleaning became the everyday normal. Staff and vendors were temperature and wellness checked to reduce the chance of exposure. And continual cleaning and continual cleaning and disinfection helped prevent an outbreak within the community, as I pointed out earlier. We received a PPP loan and CARES Act monies. These are some of the things I'm sure you've heard about in, on the nightly news, that we were able to avoid staff layoffs and had general downsizing only through normal attrition. So if an employee decided, well, no, I don't wanna, uh, be, they may be a student and they had to go back to uh, back home, left Goucher, left Towson. That was the normal attrition we had. We had almost nobody leave, uh, actually nobody that I can think of left uh, on a non-voluntary basis. We had a reduction of hours, but for the most part, the only time we had turnover is because the person wanted to move on. Uh, this also allowed us to use tax credits to ensure staff were safe and didn't come to work if they were potentially exposed to COVID-19. Uh, lastly, on-site community vaccinations were arranged and were recently implemented. Uh, we've offered them to all residents and staff. We had a 99.8% resident participation rate and staff participation is above 82%. From what I understand, since I put this together, that's now either very close to or above 90%, I believe. Uh, these steps were all needed to begin to move forward with reopening dining venues, in-person fitness space, the pool, attendance, and, and hopefully start the process of fully reopening in the next few weeks. Mark, if you could move on, please. All right, financial metrics to give you a sense of where we are. Uh, during the pandemic, entry to the community by new residents slowed substantially. Everyone was being cautious, which is understandable, but we were in a position to handle and adapt to that. The net result of this is a reduced occupancy level from pre-pandemic levels. We are using this reduction as an opportunity to consider moving some skilled license beds to assisted living memory care to better meet the needs of the community. This goes back to the project I mentioned earlier that we were hoping to complete this year, where we are expanding the uh, memory care assisted living space by an additional six rooms. We're also renovating that space to provide for a family meeting. We believe we're gonna have family meetings, uh, space for family meetings. We're going to have um, the opportunity to have on unit dining that is a little more enhanced than what we, we have now. We wanna have a fitness area within that space to have residents who are more physically fit, but need cognitive assistance and guidance, they can, stay, uh, they can stay fit without having to leave the unit. To give you a sense of where we have been and where we are now, our occupancy levels are indicated. 94% in independent living is where we were. We're still above 90% today. Assisted living did not decline significantly. We went from 91 to 87%. And skilled care, has stayed in the 60% range, though we did take those 22 memory care beds that were separated from the assisted living space out of service to allow for our planned project. We believe this is best 
meeting the needs or will be best meet the needs of the community in years to come. If we can move on, please. Some of our common financial metrics are days cash on hand. Now this metric, it measures our ability uh, as an organization to operate based upon liquid assets. Our DCOH number as of 12-31-20 was 598.58 days, essentially almost 600 days, which puts us approximately in the top third of single site providers. Our excess margin ratio is used to measure the cash flow from operating and investment sources. Inwell's investment portfolio is over 40 million between unrestricted and restricted funds and generates significant income to the community as needed. Our AMR was 11.31% in 2020 and is in the top 10% compared to that of other single site CARF accredited communities. So we're, we're doing well financially. We have a couple more metrics that I'll share, share with you, if we could please. Our debt service. The community currently has an outstanding 2015 serial bond issue through the Maryland Health and Higher Education Facilities Authority with an outstanding balance of 43,085,000. The bonds have maturity dates each January 1st with an annual debt service obligation of about three and a half million, including interest. So if you think about it, we're really only about 15 years away from the uh, entire debt service being fully satisfied. I think in fact, it, it is satisfied by 2037. Now we'll continue to look at the opportunities as to whether or not refinancing might not make a, might be a, an option. Um, but at this point, it gives you a sense of where we are in terms of our annual obligation. You may wanna ask other communities what their debt service obligation is. That debt service is gonna get passed on to residents and it gives us a sense that we're only incurring an amount necessary to meet the annual needs related to the community as it stands. We have a Fitch rating. We are reviewed annually by Fitch, uh, the Fitch rating service. The last issuance was a continuation of a BBB rating in June, 2020. We're gonna be uh, getting ready to do that again in the next couple of months. And we would hope that we at least main that rating, maintain that rating and we, We'll try to go higher. We're going to hope. Debt service coverage ratio. The bond covenants require a debt service coverage ratio of 1.20. For the year ended 12 31 20, the debt service coverage ratio was 1.28. So we met that. Now, that was in a year of great challenge with having reduced occupancy and reduced new entrants. Normally, that number is much closer to two, but there are communities, as I understand it, many as I understand, in Maryland itself, that are facing challenges meeting that coverage ratio. So their debt service obligation may not be satisfied. It's a question that I think as you're looking at other communities, you may want to consider asking, where do they stand in terms of their debt service, cover, debt service coverage ratio? So just some metrics that I thought might be of value in doing your comparatives. If we can move on, please. I want to point out a few capital improvements. With the closure of the dining rooms, we use the time to fully renovate our main dining room. I mentioned this earlier. That is the valley and the grill area. The valley room and grill area are within the same space, but they have two different options. A valley, the valley room is a traditional sit-down dining experience where you come in, order off the menu, get your appetizer, entree, dessert, and drink, where the grill is more of a buffet style dining where you can uh, go through the brand new line, have the cooks prepare your plate with the different uh, items being offered for the day. And then you take it back to your table to dine with your guests or dine with your other residents. Uh, it's, a, it's a neat option in that you can choose the different things based upon what's on the menu that day. I think it's a, it's a great way of having some flexibility in our dining. That area reopened this month and is being well received as a bright, engaging space that has greatly reduced the potential for foodborne illness and our residents greater choice in dining options. Uh, in addition to the, I'll just point out the other two while I'm on the subject. We also have a pub, which it will, when it reopens shortly, have 
an appetizer menu as well as the ability to get a drink. Now you can get out, you can get drinks served to you in the grill and valley room as well, but the appetizer option in the pub is a little more intimate. It's a little it's a little different experience, and it gives you an option, a third option for for dinner, as well as the cafe, which is open for all three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, um, and is a great option depending upon if you want a lower lower cost meal as a lighter meal throughout the day. Uh, let's see, we are also renovating the dining room for our assisted, our main assisted living space known as Southerly Place. That option is going to be renovated and completed by the end of June, I believe. Mark, is that correct? Okay, well, we'll see, we hope so. Um, but we're getting there and we're definitely gonna be doing that renovation. In 2021, we plan to invest an estimated two and a half million to reconfigure the healthcare area to better meet the needs of our residents moving forward. This goes back to the uh, renovation of Horrocks Hall, which is the assisted living memory care space that I had referred to easier. So we're hoping to make it as, uh, we're planning to make this a home-like setting for those with diminished memory and to be able to make it as pleasing as any other part of the community. If we could move on. So what to ask when comparing? Carefully review the disclosure statement and the financial statements that those communities include. If, they are not, if you are not sure about something, then feel free to ask what it means. Sometimes the numbers are confusing, but we want residents to feel comfortable that their money is safe. Now that isn't just Edenwall, that's any community. Ask, find out what they're offering, why they are offering, why are they in the position they are, what their plans are, a good community is going to be able to give you a sense of what's on the horizon, how they're going to meet the needs of the residents in the future as we move into a greater use of baby boomers. So they should have a good sense of where they are and where they're going to be. Ask about their day's cash on hand. It's a good measure of solvency and their ability to meet the operational needs of the community. We suggest a community that has at least 365 days of cash. In other words, a full year's worth of cash available to operate the community just like we had when a pandemic rolled through. Ask if they have a rating from, uh, from uh, Standard & Poor's, S&P, or Fitch. Not all communities have such a rating. That provides a good measure of the community's financial condition as rated by a third an outside third party. And also, what services are included in the agreement and which ones come with an added cost? Ask for a listing of those additional fees. Those are some of just the basic suggestions in dealing with both us and other communities. We want you to know what we're going to do, what we're offering, what it's going to cost. We want to be transparent. It's a very important aspect of who we are as a community, and we want to make you feel like you know what's going on, both now and in the future. If we can move on, please. So, life under the umbrella. I was thinking about how to wrap up the presentation and what would be a good umbrella reference. Noah didn't wait for it to start to rain before he built the ark. We've had rain, and we are today, and had our umbrella, and but our umbrella was ready to meet the needs, financial and otherwise, of a pandemic during a very challenging year. We'll keep improving the community to make it a place for everyone that everyone wants to call home. Our mission statement: Edenwald creates a caring community, inspiring people to thrive and live lives of significance. We welcome the opportunity to speak with you and find out how we can meet your goals in a financially secure and a vibrant senior living lifestyle. So with that, I will turn it back to Diane for questions. Thanks, Roland. So as the box says, if you have any questions, you can type them into the little Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And it does look like we have a question. I see it. All so right. what is the average, to, to read it for everyone, what is the average age of entry for new residents? What is the average age of residents now? What is the demographic mix of re residents, female to male? And is a, a community is focused on diversity? The answer, I'll answer the first or the last question first, and yes, we are focused on diversity. We have a diverse mix of residents from different cultures. Uh, we want to, we've uh, increased our attention towards diversity. 
the board realized it, uh, in recent times that it is important to focus on providing a welcoming environment to all members outside of the walls of Eden Wall and provide a community that is, a, is focused on providing diversity. The average age of entry for new residents, I would say is about what, 81, Debbie or Diane, is that about right? Diane, I, I think it's about 81 with the average age of new residents being about 84. What is a demographic mix of residents, female to male? It would be about 70 to 75% female and about 25 to 30% male. Another question that came in is memory area, is the memory care area locked? Are there situations in which a resident will be required to leave? Is the memory area locked? It is secured, but in the event of emergency, a resident is able to push on a, an out bar if there were a fire and they'd be able to exit the community. Our staff would, in those situations, be there to um, guide the residents and help them into a safe area so that they are secure and not able to elope away from, uh, from the area. In terms of the, um, I've forgotten what the second part of the question, oh, let's see, our situation where residents will be required to leave. Only in the event that somebody is, if, if somebody has been accepted to the community, only in the event that they are unsafe you know, to continue to be in the community. If they were, through their actions, provide a threat to themselves or others, that's about the only time that I can think of that we would have to remove somebody from the community. Can one person, next question, can one person come in under an A agreement and the other under a C agreement? It is feasible, but it would be, it would be a unique situation where somebody might have to be in healthcare and somebody be in life care in an apartment. That's something that we'd have to look at on a case by case basis. What are the arrangements? The next question, what are the arrangements should a resident outlive their funds? Well, at the outset of joining Edenwald, we do an assessment, a financial assessment to evaluate the ability for a new entrant to stay with us throughout their expected lifetime. If we accept you into the community and through no fault of your own, in other words, not gifting away your assets, you've run out of money, then we have a promise that we will continue to care for you. We have a resident assistance fund that is somewhere in the order of $5 million, five to $6 million currently that we have available should somebody run out of funds. We currently have seven res no, six residents, excuse me, that are under this program. And we evaluate, as I said at the outset, the need to um, hopefully not get into a situation where you're going to be having to come to us for that. So it's infrequent that it happens, but we do, if we bring you in, our promise is to take care of you for the rest of your life. What would the entrance fee and monthly fee be approximately for a two bedroom, two bath and den? For that, I would say that the best solution is to meet with our marketing folks. There are type A agreements, type C agreements. There are different sizes, two bedroom units. Um, and in the presentation earlier, uh, the, again, the range from roughly 100,000 up to over a million. So it's hard to give you a specific number to work with. Again, in reaching out to Diane and Debbie in marketing, we'd be glad to, to discuss specifics uh, give you more detail. Does a prospective resident have to enter an independent living level? This is something that you don't necessarily need to, but there, if you're going to come in uh, directly to a healthcare area, assisted living or skilled care, we would not be able to offer a life care contract at that point. It would be a direct admission to a healthcare or to assisted living. But yes, that is feasible. And I would ask that you Again, reach out to marketing to discuss the options and availability. Does Edenwall living experience differ? How does diff, uh, Edenwall's living experience differ today from 10 to 15 years ago? 
We have had six family members that chose to live in Ewald for an average 10, 15 years. We were very pleased at Ewald at that time. Thank you. Good, good to hear a compliment. We take, we appreciate that, Mr. Knott. Um, 10 to 15 years ago, the community was smaller. We did not have the, well, we just had the terraces opening, which allowed for some bigger units. Um, and we learned along the way what some of the amenities were. At the time, we added a pool. We added a fitness center. We expanded the auditorium. Um, we added a lot more to the public areas, a multi-purpose room. Um, we, we've, we've learned as we've grown. I think that it's been a good <coughs> growth opportunity. As the as community has grown, as the community has matured, we've tried to adapt and we're gonna to continue to try and adapt with the baby boomers on the horizon. I mean, it's, it's a reality that in three years, the greatest number of people will hit the age of 65 than at any other point in the history of the country. So we're preparing, we're aware of what we need to do to move forward and we wanna be ready for both our existing residents and keep them happy while they're here and prepare for the future. And listening to our residents is the way we would do that. So. Hey Roland, I'd like to weigh in just uh, also on that, on that question about what has changed. So I've had the pleasure of working here. It'll be 16 years in June. And I would say um, Edenwald's always been a great place. We've always been well known for our, our quality of our healthcare, our food. But I think the biggest thing that's changed um, is just the, the, the wealth of opportunities that are afforded to our residents. Uh, Leisha Galloway, who is our uh, director of lifestyle programming, she offers just an amazing array of in the pre-COVID times, and, and we're getting back to that, but just the most amazing array of, of lectures and uh, lifelong learning opportunity and musical musical entertainment and, and cultural activities outside of the building. So I think if there's if there's one thing that's changed, uh, again, it's just like an increased vibrancy in our community that, that we're really known for out in the larger Baltimore area. So thanks, Roland. Certainly. Uh, with that, we'll move on to another, the next question. And I'm gonna defer this question to Diane. <laughs> Uh-oh. About <laughs> pets, are, are pets are, allowed? Are pets allowed? I would say um, talk with us individually about that. It's something that, we were talking with Mark about pre-COVID, but then COVID kind of preempted discussion on anything else um, for the past year. So um, again, speak with us directly in reference to that. I think we're open. Certainly we have to abide by um, ADA, but again, that would be something we could answer individually. Thanks. All right, I see we're coming down to about the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, if you come in under a type C contract, what happens if you do, if you do run out of money as my long-term care policy is a three-year one? Are type A and type C folks handled the same way regarding running out of funds? And, it, and the simple answer is yes. If a resident is accepted into the community under a type A or a type C, and again, through no fault of their own and through no divestiture of assets, um, you know, if you're not crazy about spending, then we're going to, we make a promise to take care of you. We will, we would do an assessment if, if the situation arose that somebody presents to us, well, unfortunately, I'm no, I am reduced, my assets are reduced. I'm no longer going to be able to afford my monthly fee. We would do a look back for about three to five years, depending upon the situation and ask, what may have changed so that there was a need or an exhaustion of assets. But again, if we accept you into the community, we're going to, we have a promise to look at it and, and provide assistance uh, as reasonable. Next question, what is the approximate percent of debt service cost including the monthly fees? It's a very good question, 3 million over we is this a stump the CFO uh, question? <laughs> I'd say it's about 8%, give or take. I'd have to get a calculator out and do that. But I'd say it's around 8%. Uh, 
I believe that's the last question I see in the chat window. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Well, all right. If you do have questions or you would like to ask questions privately, uh, I would say, please reach out to Diane and Debbie here in our marketing, uh, marketing area. Let's go to the next slide, please, Mark. <laughs> our phone number for you to reach Debbie and Diane, 410-823-1349. You can email either that would be D. Stinchcomb, and we probably should add this to the next one, D. Stinchcomb at enrolled.org, or D Debbie Janka, you see the spelling of their names on the screen, D. Janka, J-A-N-K-A, at edenwald.org, or, and, and we invite you to follow us on Facebook at Edenwald Senior Living. And you can also email us uh, via Info, I-N-F-O, at edenwald.org. Um, we did want to uh, let you know, Roland did touch, touch briefly on some of the cost for entrance fees, monthly fees, as well as the various contract types. So Debbie and I are more than happy to give you all of that information, send you a brochure. Uh, you just need to reach out to us. We also, we are meeting with people in person or virtually, whichever is more comfortable for you. So again, please give us a call. And then I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Beggs uh, to say goodbye to our guest. Oh. <laughs> he doesn't have any volume. He doesn't yet. have any sound. <laughs> so, so Roland's gonna to have to pretend he's Mark. All right. Well, Mark and I go to the same barber, so it's not gonna to be uh, too difficult. Um, <laughs> We wanna say thank you very much everyone for attending today. We hope we've been able to answer some questions and provide some guidance when you're doing your comparison. And we look forward to meeting you in person here at Edenwald. So thank you very much again for attending. And with that, we'll say have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.